Right, we now go to questions to the Prime Minister. And I start with Gavin Newman. Gavin. Number one, Mr Speaker. Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, I am delighted that the UK is hosting the leaders of the world's greatest democracies at the G7 summit in Cornwall this week. This is the first meeting between G7 leaders since the start of the pandemic. Mr Speaker, this week is Carers Week, and I am sure the whole House will wish to join me in thanking care workers and everyone caring for family, friends and loved ones. Their selflessness and devotion to helping others is an inspiration to us all. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Can I very much echo the comments of the Prime Minister on uh, the work of unpaid carers? But um, after plenty of warm words for the victims of fire and rehire, including from the Prime Minister himself, the Government yesterday announced its legislative response to the ACAS report of doing absolutely nothing. Mm-hmm. Nothing for the hundreds of thousands already threatened, or as the ACAS report itself says, the many, many more that are anticipated to face fire and rehire when the follow scheme ends. He should be thoroughly ashamed of himself, Mr Speaker. Mm-hmm. It's increasingly clear this Government won't protect workers. So will I devolve employment law to Holyrood so the Scottish Government can? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, Mr Speaker, the Government has been absolutely clear that uh, it's unacceptable to use threats of firing uh, and rehiring as a negotiating tactic. We, uh, we welcome the ACAS uh, report, which actually finds that uh, hire and fire should only be used in limited circumstances, such as to prevent job losses, Mr Speaker, when other options have been exhausted. We therefore asked ACAS to produce clearer guidance to help uh, employers with other options. Bradley. Prime Minister, we are on a mission in the East Midlands to create 84,000 jobs for local people. We are legislating for planning powers for our development corporation, which will work in tandem with our unique inland freeport. But, Mr Speaker, decisions about HS2 and specifically the Toten Hub will have a huge impact on whether we can deliver on our vision for the East Midlands. Would the Prime Minister meet with me urgently so we can make sure we can deliver on that commitment to local people? Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, the East Midlands could have no more fervent or effective uh, champion, and I, I congratulate my honourable friend on his vision for the East Midlands Freeport and all the benefits that rail integration uh, will bring. And I know that he's about to have a meeting uh, with ministerial colleagues uh, to determine how the integrated rail plan can work with HS2 best uh, to achieve uh, his objectives. Yeah. Let's go to the leader of the opposition, Keir Starmer. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is the first PMQ since the Prime Minister and Carrie got married. So can I offer my warm congratulations to the Prime Minister and his wife and wish them a happy life together? I have to say I admire the way they managed to keep it secret. Can I join with the Prime Minister on his comments about Carers' Week? And can I also send our deepest sympathies to the four people killed in Sunday's terror attack in Canada? It was, as the Canadian Prime Minister said, an attack motivated by hatred and Islamophobia, and we must all unite against that at home and abroad. And can I ask the Prime Minister to pass on our thoughts and condolences to the Canadian Prime Minister when he sees him later this week? Mr Speaker, why does the Prime Minister think that his now former education adviser, Kevin Collins, described the government's education plan as half-hearted, that risked failing thousands of children, hundreds of thousands of children, and not being even close to meeting the scale of what is needed? Mr Speaker, first of all, I want to thank uh, Kevin Collins for his work, and, uh, but above all, I want to thank actually uh, pupils, parents, teachers for everything they've done throughout this uh, pandemic, and the struggle has been enormous, and, and actually what the government is doing is, in addition to the £14 billion, the extra £14 billion we committed, taking uh, per pupil funding in primary schools up to £4,000 per head, uh, in, se- in secondary schools up to £5,150, uh, Mr Speaker, we're now putting another £3 billion yeah. into educational catch-up with the biggest tutoring programme anywhere in the world, Mr Speaker. And it is based, it is based on the best evidence uh, that uh, we could find and that Sir Kevin could supply. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, let me get this right. In February, the Prime Minister appoints an expert to come up with a catch-up plan for education. He's a highly respected expert, consults widely and comes up with a plan. The Treasury balks at it and says we'll only provide 10%, yes, one-tenth of what's needed. 
The Prime Minister rolls over whatever he says and children lose out. So much for levelling up. Let me help the Prime Minister with the numbers. The funding he announced last week is about £50 per child per year. And even if you add in previous announcements, even if you add in previous announcements, in England it's only £310 per child over four years. Yet in the US there's a catch-up plan worth £1,600 per child. And in the Netherlands it's £2,500. So can the Prime Minister explain when he was told by his expert that he appointed that only an ambitious, fully funded catch-up plan would do, only an ambitious, fully funded catch-up plan, why did he come up with something which, in the words of that same expert, is too small, too narrow and too slow? Uh, well, well, Mr Speaker, I think that uh, the right honourable gentleman needs to do the maths because uh, actually and he needs to, to, to do some catch-up on his own mathematics uh, because uh, in, a, in addition uh, to the £14 I I've already referred to, Mr Speaker, there was already another £1.5 billion of catch-up. This is a £3 billion catch-up plan just for starters, Mr Speaker, and it includes the biggest programme of tuition of one-to-one, one-to-two, one-to-three tutorials anywhere in the world. And we all know, Mr Speaker, that there are, there are schools uh, in this country, classrooms in this country, uh, where children are getting uh, private tutorials, private tuition, thanks to the hard work of their parents. He asks about levelling up. What we want to do is get on the side of all the kids who don't have access to that tutorial, Mr Speaker, to support them. That's what I mean by levelling up, Mr Speaker. Who does the Prime Minister think he's kidding? He asked Kevin Collins to tell him what was necessary to catch up. Kevin Collins told him, and he said no. Who does he think he's kidding? The Chancellor's decision, and I assume it was the Chancellor's decision, it always is, to hold back the investment that's needed is a completely false economy. The long-term costs are likely to be at least £100 billion, probably more. And who will be hardest hit, Prime Minister? Kids from disadvantaged backgrounds. Mr Speaker, if the government doesn't change course, this will hold Britain back for a generation. And here's the difference between us and them. Because when Labour says education is our number one priority, we mean it. That's why we published published a bold £15 billion plan to catch up on education for every child. We're putting that to a vote this afternoon. If the Prime Minister is really serious about this, he'd back that motion. Will he do so? Tell you that, Mr Speaker, I'll tell you the difference between uh, us and the, and the party opposite is that we put in the tough measures that are needed to give kids a better education across the country. When we rolled out the academies programme, Mr Speaker, which have driven up standards across the country, who opposed it? They did. When we put in tough measures uh, to ensure discipline in schools, Mr Speaker, they opposed it. They, 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 at the last election, Mr Speaker, they even campaigned to get rid of Ofsted, which is so vital. But they did. They did. He stood on a manifesto to get rid of Ofsted. Will he now say, will he now say that he not only supports our, uh, our tuition programme, but he supports our radical programme to support teachers with better training? £400 million we're now putting in, not only a, a starting salary for teachers of £30,000, which we've introduced, but another £400 million to support better training for teachers. That's what we're backing in our party. They are serious, costed reforms and are based on evidence, unlike anything he's producing. Just, just, just a moment. I'm, I'm a less, little less shouting from the south. Just to say, just to remind the Prime Minister, his Prime Minister's questions, it isn't about the agenda of last general election. The Prime Minister, Ofsted, was not the question. I'm not interested in what they put on the agenda. I'm more interested in you answering the question. Mr Speaker, let me take this very slowly for the Prime Minister. The Collins Review, commissioned by the Government, was very clear. If the Collins proposed action is not taken, the attainment gap will rise between 10 and 24 per cent. That was on a slide shown to the Prime Minister last week. And he talks about the various measures, so let's look at this more closely. Which part of our plan does he oppose? The plan that's being voted on this afternoon. Is it breakfast clubs for every child? Does he oppose that? Is it quality mental health support in every school? Does he oppose that? Is it more tutoring for every child that needs it? Does he oppose that? Or additional investment for children who've suffered the most? Which part of our plan does the Prime Minister object to? And if he doesn't object to it and agrees with it, why doesn't he vote for it? 
Mr. Speaker. I, I think I'm, with great respect, Mr. Speaker, I do think I'm entitled to draw attention uh, to what the Labour Party uh, stood on at the last election. And that was, and they haven't yet repudiated it. Uh, they did want to get rid of Ofsted, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, but uh, I, will, I will tell the right honourable gentleman that if he is now saying that he supports our tutoring programme, and that's what I think I, I understood from, uh, from him just now, then that is, a, that is a good thing. Because hitherto, hitherto what has happened is that the, the, the kids of, of well-off parents, thanks to their hard work, have been able to rely on private tutoring. What the government is now doing is coming in on the side of all the other kids who don't get access to that tutoring. Six million kids, six million children, Mr Speaker, six million children will have access to, to tuition Thanks to this programme, it is a fantastic thing. It is a revolution in education for this country. If he's now saying that he supports it, Mr. Speaker, then that's a good thing. Though I've learnt in the course of the last year that his support can sometimes be evanescent, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Starman. Mr. Speaker, he, he pretends he's, on, uh, he's here for the other kids. The report says the attainment gap will go up between 10 to 24 per cent if the action isn't taken. He's just rejected it. How can he be on the side of the other kids? Come off it. We've been here before. Free school meals, U-turn. Exams fiasco, U-turn. Now catch up. The Prime Minister has been all over the place when it comes to education. And he's on the wrong side of it again. Mr Speaker, I now want to turn to this week's G7. This will be the first major summit of the since the recovery. The UK needs to lead, not just to host. The priority must, of course, be a clear plan to vaccinate the world. As the Delta variant shows, nobody is safe from this virus until everybody is safe. The Prime Minister has made big promises on this, but it needs a truly global effort to make it happen. So will the Prime Minister take the lead at the G7 and do whatever is necessary to make global vaccinations a reality? Yes, indeed, Mr. Speaker. And actually, I think uh, what the people of this country also understand is that uh, not only uh, were we able to give one of the first authorizations uh, for the AstraZeneca, uh, back, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, but also uh, thanks to the deal the government did between the Oxford scientists uh, and AstraZeneca, we were able to ensure that one uh, in three of the 1.5 billion doses that have been distributed around the world are the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. That is Global Britain in action to say nothing of the billion vaccines that we hope to raise from the G7 this week. Kirsten. Mr Speaker, that would sound a lot better if the Prime Minister wasn't the only G7 leader cutting his aid budget. Yeah. I hear what the Prime Minister says about vaccines, but we also need clear global agreement and global funding. Hundreds of former leaders Businesses and development groups have called for exactly that kind of leadership at the G7, and that's what we need to see from the Prime Minister this weekend. Mr Speaker, the G7, bilateral discussions with President Biden and the possibility of a new government in Israel also provide a real chance to restart a meaningful Middle East peace process. The appalling violence recently, which killed 63 children in Gaza and two children in Israel, shows just how urgent this is. For too many people in Palestine, the promise of an end to the occupation and a recognised sovereign Palestinian state feels more distant than ever. So will the Prime Minister take the opportunity this weekend to press for renewed international agreement to finally recognise the state of Palestine alongside a safe and secure Israel, to stop the expansion of illegal settlements and to get a meaningful peace process back up and running. Mr Speaker, it's been a long-standing objective of this government, and I think it's common ground across this House, that the solution for the Middle East peace process is a two-state solution, and we continue to press uh, for that, and uh, we, I've made that position plain in my conversations both with the Palestinian Authority and, of course, uh, with, uh, with Israel. Uh, Mr Speaker, he, he, he had text. Uh, the government, uh, I think, for failing to be sufficiently ambitious in our overseas aid uh, spending. I think I heard him say that in that uh, compendious, in that compendious <laughs> question. Uh, and I, let, me, let, let me just tell him well, he's, 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 gesturing, he's gesturing at these benches, uh, Mr Speaker. Under this government, uh, we've spent more and we continue to spend more uh, than Labour, 
evident. Yeah. Labour evident. Under, under Blair, under Brown, uh, even when they were spending money on Brazilian dancers in Hackney uh, to raise consciousness, uh, to, which is what they did to raise consciousness of global uh, poverty, Mr. Speaker, we are spending £10 billion a year at a time of acute. Uh, financial difficulty uh, for this country, and I think the British people know uh, that that is the right priority for this country. And I think, and if, and if, and if, uh, if Labour members want to vote on that matter, Mr. Speaker, and may I just remind them that the people of this country had an opportunity to vote on the way the government is handling it uh, last month, uh, and uh, the balance uh, that we were striking, and I think that they adjudicated firmly in the favour of the government, Mr Speaker. They pontificate, they pontificate and prevaricate and procrastinate. Felicity Kendall, come on! I can even... Thank you, Mr Speaker. You've made me slightly older, yes. I am very proud of my government's record on the environment and the fact that we have cut emissions at the fastest rate of any G7 country. I welcome the fact that Lancaster West Estate in my constituency has benefited from a green grant of almost £20 million to decarbonise. Does my right honourable friend agree with me that we need to build back better in a green way and in a way that levels up all parts of the United Kingdom. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I do, and uh, I, 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 thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. She's my my honourable friend is absolutely right. Uh, that's why we committed a total of three point eight billion pounds to fund energy improvement uh, in the in the performance, particularly of social rented homes. Leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm sure we're all looking forward to the European Championships kicking off later this week. Can I take the opportunity to wish all the best to? our country, Scotland, to Steve Clark and the team, and to remind the team it is time for heroes. Uh, Mr Speaker, later this week the Prime Minister will walk into the G7 summit as the only leader, the only leader, Prime Minister, cutting development aid to the world's poorest. At the very moment when global leadership is needed more than ever, this Tory government is walking away from millions still struggling from the Covid pandemic and a poverty pandemic. The Prime Minister has been hiding on this issue for months. This is a government on the run from their own moral and legal responsibilities and on the run, Mr Speaker, from their own backbenchers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the Prime Minister can't hide from this issue any longer and he can't run from democracy in this House. Will he stand up today and commit to a straight vote in this House on his inhumane cuts as demanded by the Speaker? Prime Minister, it is a very simple question. Yes or no? Yeah, yeah. And the, 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 can I, by the way, Mr Speaker, wish all the, the very best to, to Scotland and, uh, and, all, and England and all the, all the home nations who may be, who may be playing in this, uh, in this. I don't know whether he's going to reciprocate, Mr Speaker, but you never know. It's worth, worth a shot, I, worth a shot, I, I thought. Uh, uh, Oh, you did? OK, there you go. There you go. That's nice of him. Uh, well, anyway, m m Mr Speaker, uh, I think the answer is, is clear. We, we, the, the people of this country, as I, as I said to uh, the Right Honourable Gentleman, were, uh, were given a vote on this and many other matters uh, very recently, and I think they adjudicated very firmly in favour of the balance the Government is, is striking. Uh, we are in very, very difficult uh, financial times, but you shouldn't, you shouldn't believe the, the lefty propaganda. Uh, Mr. Speaker, that you hear from people opposite. We're spending £10 billion overseas. We've actually increased. We've increased. Uh, you, we, all they want to do is run this country down, Mr. Speaker. Run this country down. Uh, when, we've in, when, when, we've increased, when we've increased spending on girls' education alone to half a billion pounds, uh, almost half a billion, that is a fantastic sum of money to be spending in difficult times, Mr. Speaker. We should be proud. In Blackford. Mr Speaker, I have to say, I don't think I've ever heard the previous Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Member from Maidenhead, called the leftist propagandist. The, 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 simple, the, simple fact, the simple fact of the matter is, the simple fact of the matter, Prime Minister, is every single party, every single member of this House stood on a manifesto commitment of 0.7%. The Prime Minister has reneged on that, and the Speaker has indicated that the Government should allow a vote on it. It's pretty basic stuff. 
after a year dealing with the deadly virus. Why can't the Prime Minister get this? In a pandemic, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Now is the time to support each other, not to walk away from those in need. People are dying and they need our help. The Prime Minister has the nerve to brag about the government support for the vulnerable. And at the very same time, he is slashing four and a half billion from the world's poorest. Yeah, yeah. In the week of the G7, what kind of world leader washes their hands of responsibility by cutting water and hygiene projects by more than 80 per cent in the middle of a pandemic? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I, I may say that uh, I think that the last contribution was absolutely disgraceful because uh, the, the people of this country have gone, through, have gone through a very difficult time. We've had to spend £407 billion supporting jobs, families, livelihoods throughout the country, and yet we are continuing to support international vaccination. A £1.6 billion this country has contributed to, to Gavi. Uh, I, I think £548 million to COVAX. And, and let, me, let me just remind him of, of, of the statistic I mentioned earlier. One in three, one in three of the vaccines being distributed around the world to the poorest and the neediest come from the Oxford AstraZeneca supply. One, thanks to the deal this government did. Or, do, or, does the name, or does the name Oxford AstraZeneca continue to stick in his craw, Mr Speaker? Scott Benton. Thank you, Mr Speaker. May I welcome plans outlined by the Education Secretary last week, which will oversee a tutoring revolution in this country, a proven way to help the most disadvantaged children to catch up. Yeah. Is the Prime Minister able to confirm that this is just one part of our wider plan to ensure that no child misses out as a consequence of a disruption caused by this pandemic? Yeah. Yes, Mr Speaker. I thank my honourable friend because the whole point of the tutoring programme is that it is evidence-based and uh, every, every tutoring uh, programme, uh, for, for, and I say there, there are six million uh, pupils, uh, uh, children who can benefit uh, is equivalent to uh, three to five months of educational catch-up. Uh, we're also, Mr Speaker, going to be looking at increasing time in schools. And I hope that the uh, loyal opposition, Mr Speaker, may use their influence with their paymasters in the teaching unions uh, to, uh, to encourage them in that objection. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister knows full well uh, that the best way to reduce checks in the Irish Sea is to do a Swiss-style SBS agreement yeah. with the European Union. So far, he's decided not to do that. So why is he prioritising cheap, dodgy beef from Australia over the concerns of the people of Northern Ireland and reducing checks in the Irish Sea? Uh, no, Mr Speaker. What, what we're, what we're prioritising is the right and ability of the people of Northern Ireland uh, to have access as they uh, should freely uh, and uninterruptedly to, uh, to goods and services from the whole of the UK. Uh, and we are working uh, to ensure that we protect the territorial and economic integrity of our country. That's what matters. Kevin Holland. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, the Prime Minister's excellent first homes policy will allow tens of thousands of key workers and local first-hand buyers to buy a home every year at a discount of up to 50% from the market price. Would you consider turbocharging this policy with the estab by establishing a national land commission to assemble public sector land to facilitate the development of potentially hundreds of thousands of more half-price homes so more people can see the benefits of home ownership? Yeah. Uh, Mr. If I thank my honourable friend. Uh, it, it last year we delivered the highest, in, in spite of the difficulties we faced, the highest number of new uh, homes for over 30 years, but his point is an extremely good one, as all honourable members know. Uh, we must find better, faster ways of releasing publicly owned land, brownfield sites uh, for development, and that is exactly uh, why we're looking at the suggestion he makes. Marisha. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister, in his very first speech, mentioned levelling up. My constituents want to know when it's going to start. The fact of the matter, and I understand that he's lived a life of privilege and doesn't know much about the public state sector. He knows a lot about the private sector in education. What are the markers for success? His head of his own industrial strategy council says his levelling up 
with these resources, with this uh, management team, will not work and will not be successful. My local Kirkley's council says it's so complex, nothing is flowing down to the grassroots. When will we see the first signs of genuine levelling up in our country? Uh, Mr Speaker, I think that uh, what you're seeing across the country is people responding uh, to massive investment, £640 billion programme of investment in roads, in schools, in, in hospitals, uh, in policing, uh, that it, bit by bit is transforming people's lives, hopes uh, and opportunities. And that is fundamentally the difference between uh, his side of the argument and ours. We believe that there is uh, talent, genius, flair around the whole country, but opportunity is not evenly distributed. And that is uh, our ambition and, and that is what we are doing with our, with our campaign to levelling up. If he's now saying by the way, that he supports what we're, say, what we're doing on the tutoring uh, revolution, because I know he's a great educational expert, then uh, I'm glad to hear it. Brendan Clarks. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My constituents in Bassetlaw have been the victims of illegal encampments, uh, most recently at Far Park in Worksop, where local taxpayers have been left with a clean-up bill running into thousands of pounds, and residents have been left feeling powerless following a sustained period of antisocial behaviour in the locality. Can the Prime Minister tell us what steps we are taking now to ensure we stop this from happening in the future and allow residents and local authorities to take back control of trespassing? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, the uh, Police Crime Sentencing and Courts Bill, uh, my honourable friend uh, will be uh, pleased to know, introduced a new criminal offence where a person who resides or intends to reside on land with a vehicle and without permission has caused or is likely to cause significant damage or distress, uh, can face new penalties, Mr Speaker. And guess who voted against that bill on a three-line whip? Does anybody know? It was the right honourable gentleman and his entire party. Vivian Hamilton. Mr Speaker, um, a few years ago, one of my elderly constituents with late-stage dementia was married by a man who'd befriended her. Upon her death, the man subsequently inherited the whole of her estate because under the law as it stands, their marriage had revoked her previous will. Hundreds of people since then have contacted me citing similar experiences, but three registrars general have refused to meet me to discuss it. So will the Prime Minister now act to bring this cruel exploitation to an end? Well, I thank the honourable gentleman for raising uh, the concern that he has and, uh, uh, and, and the injustice that he mentioned. I will make sure uh, that he gets a, a meeting as soon as possible uh, with the relevant uh, minister in the Justice Department. David Jones. Uh, Mr Speaker, according to newspaper reports, the European Union are unhappy with the negotiating style of the Right Honourable Lord Frost. Uh, but does my Right Honourable friend agree that, in fact, Lord Frost is doing a superb job negotiating in the natural interest? And uh, does he further agree with Lord Frost's uh, assessment that uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol, as currently applied, is unsustainable and that matters would be considerably easier if the European Union were to ad adopt a more pr pragmatic ap approach uh, rather than the purest approach they're adopting at the moment? Uh, I, I thank my, my right honourable friend and I, I agree with him. Uh, completely, because I, I think that uh, David Frost, Lord Frost, is doing an outstanding job, and I, I, I venture to say, Mr. Speaker, he is the greatest Frost since the great Frost of 1709, or whatever it was. Andrew Gwynn. Thank you. The Prime Minister has seen his adviser on ethics and standards resign over his failure to uphold the ministerial code. He's seen the head of the government's legal department resign over his failure to uphold international law. And he's seen his adviser on education catch-up resign over his failure to provide proper funding for children. Why does the Prime Minister think this keeps happening to him? Yeah. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm indebted to everybody who serves the government in whatever uh, capacity. We have uh, a lot of uh, very tough decisions to make, but we will continue to get on with delivering the people's priorities. And by the way, uh, we will continue to ensure that uh, we deliver value uh, for money, that we don't waste uh, taxpayers' money, and that uh, ministers follow the ministerial code. Theresa May. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In April 1989, 96 Liverpool fans were unlawfully killed at Hillsborough. Yet nobody has been successfully prosecuted for their part in those unlawful killings. The most recent trial collapsed because although it was accepted 
that police evidence had been altered, because it was evidence to a public inquiry, it did not constitute perversion in the course of justice. Will my right honourable friend urgently look at the ramifications of this judgment for current and future public inquiries and ensure that in future people are given the justice that has been so cruelly denied to the families of the Hillsborough 96? Mr Speaker, I thank my right honourable friend for her question. And, uh, of course, the families of the 96 who died in the Hillsborough disaster, uh, and, uh, those uh, who were injured, have shown tremendous courage and uh, determination. Now, my right honourable friend uh, raises a, a particular uh, issue about uh, the recent court case and asks for a, a review of the law, and I can give her uh, the assurance that we will always consider opportunities uh, to review the law and how it operates if necessary, and we will certainly be looking at the case she describes. Let's go to Peter Grant. Peter. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In just over three years, the directors of Blackmore Bond PLC took £46 million of other people's money and made it disappear. Around 2,800 small investors who the directors promised that money would be secure, now face losing everything. Most of the money, around £26 million, was only taken by Blackmore Bond after the Financial Conduct Authority had compelling evidence from an expert witness who told them he thought the company was breaking the law, but before the FCA took any decisive action. How many more scandals like this will it take before we have a regulatory environment that's fit for purpose and offers our constituents proper protection against investment investment scams. I, I thank the Honourable Gentleman for raising the, the case he does. I'm afraid, Mr Speaker, I, I have uh, no advance notice of it and uh, can't comment on the case in question, except to say, uh, if you will send me details, uh, we will get back to him uh, as soon as we can. David. I'm delighted that South End on Sea has now been given the opportunity to become a city. But in the 50s, 60s and 70s, a million and a half ladies were forced to give up their babies for adoption. By any standards, that was cruel, and the hurt is still felt by those ladies today. So will my right honourable friend agree with me that an apology should be given and an acknowledgement that forced adoptions was wrong by all those involved in the process? Mr Speaker, I echo my honourable, my right honourable friends, uh, sentiments about South End, uh, but also uh, what he says about those who have been affected by forced ad adoption. Uh, the, the practices that led to forced adoption can't now occur because the law uh, protects uh, both parents. Uh, he, he asked for a, an apology, Mr Speaker, and I can tell him that the agencies involved in forced adoption in the past uh, have apologised uh, for their role, uh, Mr Speaker, and quite right too. Let's go to Ian Lavery. Ian. Um, thank you, Mr Speaker. As eloquently highlighted by my right honourable friend, the Leader of the Opposition, recent reports have revealed that during the, the pandemic, the loss in learning has been absolutely catastrophic. The North East is once again sadly trailing the field. And in some subjects, more than double the loss of other regions. The attainment gap, which has been mentioned, uh, between the most and least affluent areas is set to grow potentially at 10 to 24 percent. That's desperate, you know, really desperate. The government's catch up funding is quite simply derisory, too small, too narrow, too slow. Our comments have been articulated by the former education recovery chief before his unfortunate resignation. Prime Minister, the parents in Wandsbeck, in my constituency, are listening. You've got a wonderfully privileged educational background. Can you use it to explain how, how 20 pence per day helps kids in my patch catch up? Prime Minister. Uh, Mr. Mr Speaker, I, I can tell the right the Honourable Gentleman that he's, uh, again, I'm afraid what he's saying is completely wrong. The sums are huge that we're already investing in education, and we've announced the, the £3 billion additional uh, package of catch-up, including the biggest, uh, not just investing 
in teacher training, another four hundred million uh, to help teachers improve their uh, their qualifications as they uh, as they go up the ladder. But also uh, the biggest t- tuition program in the history of this country, the biggest anywhere in the world, and th- that will make a huge difference uh, to young people in Wandsbeck and across the country. Um, many kids are getting uh, private tuition at the moment, Mr. Speaker. Oh, loads aren't. Uh, we want to level up. Mr. Speaker. Recently, I met with Gianni Singh, who founded the Seek Helpline 25 years ago and is based on West Bromwich High Street. We met to hear about the fantastic work they've done over the years supporting the community with advice on issues such as hate crime, domestic violence, bullying, mental health, addiction and more. Will the Prime Minister join me in thanking Gianni G and their team for their work and wish them the very best of luck with their 350-mile charity bike ride from Edinburgh to West Bromwich next month? Uh, I thank my honourable friend for raising the the, uh, important work of work of Seek Helpline UK, and I'm I'm very happy to join her in wishing Johnny Singh and her team the very best of luck uh, for their charity bike ride, Mr. Speaker. Jonathan Edwards. Mr. Speaker, Brexit is uh, quickly turning into a story of betrayals. Firstly, it was the uh, Northern Irish Unionists, then it was the fishermen, and now our farmers face a skewed trade deal with Australia. The big question, therefore, is. Who comes next? Considering that the Trade Remedies Authority want to cut the protections on a half of steel products previously protected by by the EU, are our steel industry and the vast supply chain they sustain next in line? No, Mr Speaker, but uh, can I just suggest to the uh, Honourable Gentleman that, that, that once again uh, he is completely missing, I think, the, uh, the dynamism and, uh, and optimism of so many people I meet in the agricultural sector who see opportunities uh, for Welsh lamb and Welsh beef uh, around the world. Why isn't, why isn't he thinking of this as, something, uh, as an opportunity for exports, Mr Speaker, instead of cowering uh, in this way? Uh, Welsh lamb, Welsh beef, Welsh farmers can do brilliantly from the deals we are opening up around the world, and he should be championing uh, Welsh agriculture and Welsh produce. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In East Surrey, I've been working with brilliant parish councils in Smallfield, Burstow and Horn to ensure we can get a better balance on HGV movements, allowing local businesses to thrive, but also ensuring that residents feel safe. I welcome the government's work to clamp down on moving traffic offences, but would the Prime Minister also consider taking another look at the powers of the Traffic Commissioner to ensure that we can find this balance? Prime Minister. Uh, yes, Mr Speaker, I thank my uh, honourable friend for raising this point. Uh, tra- traffic enforcement out- outside London can only be undertaken by the, uh, by the police, but I will certainly look at the role of the Traffic Commissioner in, uh, in the uh, cases that she describes. The law book. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Our greatest national asset best of this country, record increase in funding, saved my life, no question, my number one priority, all things the Prime Minister said about our NHS. Yet award-winning South Tyneside Hospital has lost vital services and been told by his government to make further cuts to remaining services. Later today, I am presenting a petition on behalf of over 40,000 of my constituents against these cuts. Like me, They want him to help us save our hospital, ensure for once that he is able to match his rhetoric with some action. Will he? Uh, Yes, Mr Speaker, and uh, uh, all the changes that she mentions will be consulted on in the usual way. I note that Dr Shahid Wahid, the Executive Medical Director of the Trust, was recently quoted in the Shields Gazette as saying, this is about improving uh, surgical services. It is not about downgrading anything. And uh, she mentions cuts, Mr. Speaker. This government, this year alone, has given another £92 billion, £92 billion uh, to support our NHS on top of the huge commitments uh, we already made. Final question, Jacob Young. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yesterday we had the fantastic announcement of £25 million of investment into Redcar Town Centre, which will allow us to build a new water sports facility at Cordham, a new indoor activity centre on the Esplanade, and give the town a much needed lift. I'm working with the Council on other bids for Eston and TS6 area, but in the meantime, can I invite the Prime Minister to come to the mighty red car and see our plans for levelling up our area, and I'll even treat him to a lemon top. Uh, well, thank you, well, Mr. Speaker. I thank my honourable friend, who is a fantastic advocate for the people uh, of Redcar, and uh, thanks, at least partly, to his advocacy. We've announced uh, a. a 
Towns deals to benefit uh, Redcar. Uh, the levelling up fund uh, will help uh, secure local uh, investment in infrastructure and communities uh, in Redcar. And as and when my diary permits, Mr. Speaker, I will uh, be thrilled to come and join him for what I think he described as a, as a lemon top. Uh, <laughs> On that basis, I am now suspending the House for three minutes to enable necessary arrangements to be made for the next business order.